about the rest of this year. So. Yeah, let's go ahead and uh, pray and get started. So we would. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us here together again to study your word and to grow together. And we ask that you would be with us now. I ask that you would uh, grant us your Holy Spirit, help us to understand what you have for us today. Help us to put that into practice as individuals and as a congregation as well. Help us to work together, Lord, we pray, to, in your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you'll take out your yeah, revitality sheets, if you don't have one, there are extras right over there that Regina has ready for anybody. Uh, page six, page six. Rather than skip and go into Acts chapter seven, we decided it would be better for us to just go ahead and continue on uh, and uh, we're, we're having such good discussions that it's taking a long time to get through the material. Uh, now, uh, maybe you remember that last week we were uh, talking about how we have limited resources and how we can't do everything, but we can do what the Lord puts in front of us. And that we need to be taking a look at uh, not only what we would like to see happen and hope that other people will do, but what is the Lord uh, giving us? What, uh, what kind of things can we do to contribute and to uh, complement what other people are doing? And so number six there, it says strategic planning is a first article gift, building consensus. So as we plan together, we not only want to use wisely the limited resources that God has given us, because he's directing us into certain, into certain areas, we also want to do it together, to, uh, to be in agreement about what we're gonna be doing. Uh, so if somebody could, wouldn't mind maybe starting to read the first couple paragraphs and then somebody else can read the, uh, the next couple. Uh, there's a little bit of stuff to read here first before we get started. Number six. Yeah, before going any further, uh, 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 we, we don't have to check the boxes, I think we'll, but just read it if you would. Okay. Before going any further, check the boxes and the statement, blah, blah, blah. We are going to talk more about this at our Saturday session. In all likelihood, we have considered what every one of these Bible studies selected from the above statements, there would be a variety of responses. People are different. We have different perspectives. Our personalities are different. Our experiences are different. That isn't bad. In fact, according to 1 Corinthians 12, it's a good thing. But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet. I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and of those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we, we bestow in the greater honor, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Stop, let's stop there for just a second. Now, what does that mean in 1 Corinthians that she just kept on reading? means we're all tied to the hip. Okay, <laughs> whether we like it or not. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, you can uh, you can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family, right? Yeah. And God is the one who has chosen us yeah. to be family. Uh, but what, what else can we learn from this in First Corinthians? That every single um, part of the church is just as important. Like, yeah. don't think much about, like, the toes of your feet. 
Going up the toes of your feet, you'll fall, face forward, you stand, you won't be able to walk. Uh -huh. Many people don't pay much attention to that. Right. Or the, nail, so, or the finger dents on your bed, your, the nail dents on your fingers, stuff like that. So that if, if, even if there's somebody in the church that you consider to be one of the little toes, yeah, they're, they're, they're still important, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. and, and that means also uh, something else. If you consider yourself to be a little toe, you say, I can't do very much. Well, uh, you know, God is saying here, you're an important part of the body. Sorry, was somebody just wanted to say something over here? I wanted to say that it's not up to us to say you don't belong here. Uh-huh. You know, we, we don't have that right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Uh, we, we kind of leaped over the boxes up at, uh, on top. Um, it, it, it's basically just uh, different opinions about strategic plan. Whether how it, it is it uh, should we make full use of strategic planning, or is it something we can kind of benefit from strategic planning? Or eh, it's sort of there, but it wouldn't hurt to try at least. Uh, you know, or I don't see it's a benefit. And I think that it's a waste of time. You know, you kind of go the gamut uh, of everything there. And uh, I, I think probably our responses would be in uh, different areas there. One of the things that I think that uh, First Corinthians is showing us is that we don't have to all be in agreement on every detail in order to be a part of the body of Christ. Um, it's okay to be in disagreement now and again. I think that sometimes Sometimes we get the feeling that everybody in the church should be in agreement with what I think is right because if they're not, they're not in tune with God. And uh, maybe there's a little bit more room for differences. Can we keep on reading and get, uh, get to the questions? Yes, somebody? Well, let me just say, that I think this is very, very good that you are having this, this planning. I've been through a lot of call processes and we didn't have that. We did make good decisions most of the time. But I'm, I'm very impressed with this, how you're approaching this and all working together to find out where you want to go with things. And it, it, it's just, I think it's a great idea. Right. Well, thank the, thank the Lord for that, right? I mean, we want to do what he wants. Yep. Not just what we feel like doing. Well, yeah. not even... Even the sparrow is important to him that falls. So. Yes, that's true. <laughs> They're all important. That's true. Okay, someone would like to read the next couple of paragraphs, if you would. No. Go ahead, Regina. Our physical strength of some things are a strength. When we listen and learn from each other, we gain deeper and more broad understanding of what we're discussing. Unfortunately, sins often turn the strength into weakness. When people insist on the perspective as the only correct perspective and refuse to consider how other people do things, we end up polarized and cringe. This can lead to fractions, forming, and divisions in the body. How do we avoid fractions and divisions in our congregation? It starts by recognizing that our congregation, as the body of Christ, is arranged according to God's purpose and desire. This means that people who make up our congregation are driven by his design. It is a blessing to have these multiple perspectives, even when order is leading <laughs> okay, now we're going to check the boxes. Who's the, in agreement with the voters meeting going along? Okay, go ahead. We should recognize that the different kinds of people who make up our congregation and the various perspectives that they bring to this, sorry, bring to the discussion our gifts from God. When we do, it helps us to be patient with each other and value one another. It also helps us to achieve agreement and agree what is called consensus and it's in strategic planning terms. Consensus is an integral part of strategic planning. It is much more than defining matters by the majority voting. Consensus is reaching a level of agreement that the congregation as a whole can and will support. It is an expression of the call of 7 Corinthians. Chapter 13, verse 11, 
smiling, brothers rejoice, aim for respiration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace and the God of love, and he will be with you. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's more than the majority wins. It's that even if I'm in the minority and I don't think that this is exactly the right way to go, I say I'm part of the congregation and I'm going to make sure that this works to the best of my ability. Uh, I'm not going to spend my time undercutting it. I'm going to spend my time supporting it. Um, maybe, uh, maybe an illustration that is completely divorced from our experience as a congregation uh, there was a lady who came to the Missionary Institute, where I'm the director, and from Columbia, and she wanted to study to become a deaconess. And we, uh, she began the course of studies, and over the course of almost a year, her visa was almost up, and she was going to go back to Columbia. Uh, she, it, one of the ladies at, uh, at San Pablo Lutheran Church introduced her to her son, and uh, they very quickly decided to get married. And I was thinking all along, this is a bad idea. <laughs> that, that they do not know each other very long. She's really kind of doing this because she wants to stay in the United States and serve here. I don't think that this is gonna be good, but they decided they got married. And I said, well, they got married. I need to support them as much as I can so that this works out. Today, they are still married, they are still going strong, they, are, they, they have formed a wonderful family, and they are serving the Lord. And I, uh, you know, I, I said, well, yeah, it probably wasn't a good idea to do, I would recommend that other people do that, and, you know, I, I was, but mine was the minority opinion, and I was saying, well, instead of going and telling them how bad an idea it was after they took the step, yeah, I said, you know, they did it. I need to support them. I need to make. I need to pray for them. I need to uh, do what I can to make sure that it works. And I think that that happens in our in our church as well. You know, there's going to be t none of us. We're not going to have a hundred percent on just about anything. And hopefully, on Jesus, we're hundred percent, right? But you know, on, on some of the day to day details, we're all. There's always going to be something that we're going to say. Would be that could be better. And well, we can try to make it better, but it doesn't always have to be in accordance with what I think. Maybe uh, I just, uh, when, when we all get together and we say we're, we're going this direction, I say, hey, I, 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 I may not be in agreement with this detail or that detail, but I, I, I'm going to do my part. I, I'm not going to just talk behind people's backs and say what a bad idea it is. Uh, I'm going to say, well, I, I, I'm not sure about this, but I'm, I'm here because this is my church and this is what the Lord wants. Well, I, I should stop serving. Wait until the new constitution is presented. What was that? Wait until the new constitution is presented. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's well, the first but I think that that's the best. But I think that's the attitude. We, we need to talk about those details and we need to get them as, as right as we can, but we're never going to be perfect. And, uh, you know, sometimes we're going to make mistakes, and that's part of, the, part of the thing. You know, when we started the Missionary Institute again, you know, we thought, we had this vision that it was going to be a residential school. We were going to have all these people coming into El Paso and staying at, at San Pablo in the dorms and studying and all that kind of stuff. We, we found out that wasn't the way it was going to work. And uh, very quickly we ended up getting online, and that's where we are today, you know. Sometimes you make a false step, but that's a necessary step to get beyond that to where you need to be. Um, okay, uh, the questions. It says, why is it a good thing that the Lord brings together different kinds of people with differing perspectives to make up our congregation? I think it's to try new things, but however, I will say this, because this is, this is like the, the legacy of disaster of planet Earth and all the countries in my world and all nations. We as human beings, we have something that's called cognitive dissonance. And let's say maybe I report a new idea, maybe I have like total power, right? And then, and then after two years, it fails. 
instead of saying, hey, my idea was ahead of them, you retract it, say, just give me two more and I'll make it work. Give me two more and I'll make it work. Uh -huh. And then it's been 30 years of the same bad idea, and I just refuse to admit that it was wrong, and we should have just retracted it. I'm all for trying new things, right? Because yeah. bad things are going to happen. There's going to be bad ideas that leak in and are in power. But we need to recognize, like, hey, we've been doing this for a while now. It's not working. Just pull it out and do something different. Yeah. What is it they say? Uh, uh, it, craziness is doing the same thing, hoping for a different outcome. Well, all the politicians do it, though. Yeah. All of them. Mao Zedong, Vladimir Lenin, the crazy guy we have right now, the crazy two people we had last time, they have the, they've been having the same policies since the 1960s. And they're like, what can nothing's change? It's like, So I, are you saying that maybe having different kinds of people may help us when it comes time to make a change? That I uh, we, have, we need to, to listen give, to each other? We need to give everybody a chance mm -hmm. and see which fits best. So maybe I, I have an idea, but if, if it sucks, like let's say like it's been like a year now, you're saying, hey, you know, your idea sucks, bro. I'm sorry, but we're gonna remove it. That's fine, I'll pick somebody else to go. Mm -hmm. but maybe their idea might work. It's like this idea is yeah. great, we're gonna use it for the next go ahead. Yeah. I, I have a little bit of difficulty. In my experience, uh, now this one I'm speaking so I find that Whatever I try to do, whether it's a technical arena or just something around the house, for example, if I talk to other people that have done those kinds of things, or even if they haven't, just the fact that I'm throwing it out, it helps me think it through now. And I end up with a better, better idea or a better way to do it. Time and time again, I see that. Uh, yeah. Um, no. Mark Kemp loves to quote a verse, and I don't remember which one it is. Can you Robert says, please spell the here because we can't hear very well. Thank you for letting me know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I find in my experience that if I talk to different people about my particular starting idea and I get some input or some of their experience, if they have it, in that particular arena, then I end up with a better idea. Yeah. If you if you if you listen to other people that may not agree with you, you may be able to refine your idea a little bit better. Uh -huh. yeah. I think yeah. we call it synergy. I'm sorry. Synergy. Synergy. Yeah. Okay. A group of people, yeah. different ideas. Well, even Just even if somebody idea. else is not in agreement with you, yeah, sometimes that causes you to think things yeah. through a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, Mark Kempf who used to be with the uh, uh, Center for Hispanic Studies at Concordia Seminary. Uh, he loved to quote Proverbs, and I don't remember the exact verse, but it, it was that it, one person sharpens the other, like as if you have uh, a, a knife and a, the, what do you call it, the whips, what's all? Yeah. yeah, you know, one, one person sharpens the other when you're, uh, Talking because you have to you have to figure out you can't just assume I'm right you have to defend your idea and maybe you're not as right as you thought you were or maybe you need to adjust it or maybe maybe it just clarifies why you're right <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah well God made us all different and sure. you we need young people and older people and it strengthens the idea when you gather together mm -hmm. yeah. One reason why we all get together for worship and don't just kick out the uh, the youngest ones, right? They make a little fuss. Well, they're learning. Do we need together? Um, I think yeah. that the Lord brings together different people because uh, He wants us all to develop the Christian character mm -hmm. that comes when you interact with different people. I mean, you can't do that in isolation. You really have to interact with people, you know, to understand, to have patience, to love them the way they are, you know, to yeah. also to forgive them, you know, um, to forgive yourself, you know, do those things that the Lord wants us to do and to develop the Christian character. Love requires community, doesn't it? Yes. And differences. 
Hey, can, what about the next question there? How does having people in our congregation with differing perspectives make reaching agreement on important matters more challenging? I think it almost answers itself, doesn't it? <laughs> we have to give and take. <laughs> yeah. Well, the meetings take longer. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You know, we, we just had a, a meeting of the Lutheran Hispanic Missionary Institute, the Board of Directors, on Thursday, and we went two and a half hours. Wow. They have a lot of things we disagree on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the exception. If, if, if we ever call you to be a board member, don't don't consider that it's going to be two and a half hours <laughs> of meetings. Yeah. Usually it moves along a little bit better than that. But we were talking about the budget, you know? Oh. Budget is always is always uh, uh, a place for a lot of differences. Uh, yes, please. One of the reasons it's more challenging is that we have people of different backgrounds, different kind of cultures, um, Hispanic culture, German, we have Vietnamese, English, we have uh, the whole smattering of it. Each of those cultures brings their own beliefs and their own responses to a stimuli. And we are resistant to change what we are comfortable with. Yeah. And that is one of the reasons why we have so, a lot of difficulty uh, or challenge in especially the strategic planning. Uh, that, that's a good point. Yeah. And a lot of times we take it for granted that what we're used to is the way it should, has to be, because obviously that's the way it is, right? Uh, it, kind of like a, a fish in the water, we, we, we don't really even notice that we're taking the water for granted and that somebody else has something different. Yeah. Is it a cult tradition? Different what? <laughs> Is it a cult tradition? Tradition. Tradition. Oh, tradition, yeah. yeah. Very, very true. Well, yeah. What we did before it has to be good or something. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, traditions can be very good. Some, yeah, you know, they can be very good. They can help you keep from making mistakes that other people made earlier on. But then sometimes traditions just become traditions because they're they've been there for so long, and it doesn't allow us to to adapt to new situations. Um, yeah. I, I think I may have shared with you some sometime uh, about the. Uh, the, the lady who was preparing a pot roast for the oven, yes. and she cut off. Yeah, I've shared that, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to share it again. <laughs> tradition for the sake of tradition. That's right. uh, it, we do it. We do it. Uh, when, when I was in Venezuela as a missionary, I found that I had to be very careful when we were starting a church in Monacay. I had to be very careful about what I did at the beginning because very quickly it became a tradition that could not be broken. Uh, thinking about worship times, at the beginning, we had two places, one in Maracay and another in a, a, a small town named Cagua. And we had worship services in the morning in Cagua, and we had worship services in the afternoon in Maracay. Well, after a while, uh, we found that the people from Cagua could very easily get on a bus <coughs> and come to Maracay, and we decided to consolidate. But the people in Maracay didn't want to switch from the afternoon to the morning. Even though the afternoon was a lot hotter and we had no air conditioning in the church. Uh, and there were other reasons to, to, to switch to the, the morning. It had become a tradition. And during the whole time that I was there, at various occasions, I brought it up to the, to the congregation hey, don't you want to switch to the morning? And uh, it always got shot down. It took it until I left and a new pastor came in that it actually switched to the morning. And a lot of people that went, Phew. but you know, it, was, it, it wasn't that they, the afternoon was better, it was just that it was a tradition. Okay, so it does make, yeah. I have a thought about it. Um, this consensus, reaching consensus, consensus that is sort of unique to congregational life, um, and that is the silent agreement or disagreement. Because you have within the fold 
people that will not tell you what they're really thinking, but they have a view of you. An opinion, yeah. Yeah, and they act on that. Mm -hmm. But if you don't search it out, if you don't provide the, the mechanism to bring it out, you're going to have this this cancer. This mm -hmm. is what it is. Yeah. And you and this is this is un, un, unlike uh, corporate entities, mm -hmm. you know, because you you make a decision, people line up, and if they don't like it, they can go somewhere else. Right. But we just said here. I mean, we can't. We can't just We're tell family, somebody that yeah. disagrees, you know, hit the, hit the road. Yeah. So I think we have a responsibility as we're making plans and as you're making, uh, setting these objectives to make sure that we are probing and finding out what the people are thinking who say nothing. Yeah. That, that's a good point, and it is especially the case uh, amongst Hispanics because the one of the um, now again, please, whenever we talk about Hispanics or non-Hispanics in general, we're talking sociologically, and you you need to be careful. You don't paint everybody with the same brush. Okay, people are different, but the uh, the people who study this stuff say that there there is in. Uh, Hispanic cultures a tendency to uh, openly agree with the leader, whatever the leader says, and then uh, in private, that's when they're going to express their disagreement. And it's up to the leader to figure out what they're not telling them sometimes. Do you remember that that continent has had really bad rules for the past few thousand years? If it wasn't the Aztecs killing each other, it was the Spaniards imposing their rule. And after the Spain, the communist uh, dictators and fascist dictators. It's a, it's a people that have a, I, I like to call it a Stockholm Syndrome. My dad was a special forces guy who went to Colombia and he fought for communism down there. And, and, and the communist government as well, he fought them. But they have this Stockholm Syndrome where they like to like disagree in private but not for because they're afraid of, of, of yeah. retaliation. It's, it's not always being afraid though either. It, it's something you you can see in um, even in Spain. I went to Spain. Yeah, and I, saw, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, but it's like Stockholm syndrome. Like they just it, it can it can be, but also I think it's there's something in that culture because you can see that in. Um, uh, far Eastern cultures as well, you know, the Japanese and the Chinese. You, you you don't you don't dishonor your leader. You don't dishonor your uh, 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 the elders in your family. But, but you have a respect to the authority. Yeah, and if that's and, what it is, you know, you respect it. Yeah, and so sometimes that can cause that you know culture clash kind of thing because the uh, the Non-Hispanics are, are among us are going, well, you had a chance to say something, why didn't you say something? And the Hispanics are going, how could you say that and dishonor the leader that way? But I'll go ahead and say my, speak my, my mind afterwards in private, you know? But that makes it challenging, okay? That makes it challenging. That's what we're talking about. That makes re reaching agreement on important matters more challenging. It doesn't mean, doesn't mean you can't do it. it. Just means that you realize, like you were saying, that there are uh, people who may or may not speak up when we're in a group like this, but they still have opinions. And uh, if we want to know what people are thinking, we need to be able to talk one on one uh, and uh, get some of that out. Uh, what would you suggest for finding out what people are not saying? Small group ministries. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Maybe we can make. You got to know. We have to know people. Yeah. There's no way to know what. Uh, you know. I'll just use you and me as an example. We've been together for 15 years. I I think I can pretty well guess how you want to react to certain situations. Mm -hmm. 
and not because of great insight, but because I know you. Yeah. It can be uh, intimidating to speak out in front of people. Yeah. Unless you feel really strong. Mm -hmm. If you don't feel really strong, you're not going to be typically, you might not say much. Mm -hmm. But if you're in a small group, and you just go around the table, and everybody's really asked to put in some work. Yeah. Then you may be more free. Especially if you've met a couple of times and you kind of get yeah. an idea. Yeah. Uh, did you guys hear what he said? Yes. Yeah. More or less, he was saying it can be intimidating to speak out into a large group, but it may be easier in a smaller group where everybody's sharing. Or, or maybe you can make uh, anonymous cards. I mean, I've seen this in other churches. Keep in mind, though, some people they're going to try and get expired out of you just to get expired out of you, but some might actually come with pretty good ideas mm -hmm. or a pretty logical understanding of, hey, this is why I actually disagree with you. But an anonymous suggestion box. Like a like yeah, like an anonymous <coughs> box like here, put, put this in there with no name or nothing, just have the letter. Yeah. Just keep in mind though, some people are gonna try and get a rise out of you because you've seen that in church like, right. Who wrote this? This is horrible and, and some of them are really mean. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, we, we have that problem with uh, uh, social media today, too, right? I mean, yeah, yeah but, because but, some, but I think it's a good suggestion as, like, like if someone actually has a valid claim of why maybe the idea or whatever you want is, is bad, you know what I'm saying? Gives them a chance. Yeah, might not be a bad idea to the Constitution uh, Committee to have a suggestion box somewhere. <laughs> It may be a little late. <laughs> a little late. <laughs> well, you know, I can, I can see that. I can see you know, doing something like that. Uh, there was a time in Venezuela where I tried to ask people what their favorite hymns were so we could include them in the in it. And very few people would respond. But, you know, things like that. You were saying, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> you, you, are you saying you would like to do that or you tried it? Uh, I'm not sure we've ever publicly tried it, but I do hear about suggestions. People will come to me and say, oh, I wish we could sing this hymn or that hymn. Uh, or this person really wants to do a solo uh, or would like us to sing this song. I try to accommodate those things as best I can, if it will, you know, if it's at yeah. all appropriate. Right. Well, that's why we're singing the first hymn that we are today, because several people told me they liked that hymn and we wanted, wanted to do it, even though it's not a, a, a very easy hymn to sing sometimes. But, uh, yeah. It's yours, Pastor. What's that? That's, when, when we sing that, we know you're here. That's uh, right. Okay. Yes. yes. Uh, the next question, when we are working to reach agreement on important matters, in what ways are we living out the ideal that there may be no division in the body, but the members, but that the members may have the same care for one another? 1 Corinthians 12. In what ways are we struggling with this? Uh, so, thinking about our meetings as a congregation, uh, are there ways in which we are putting this into practice now? Are there things that we're struggling with to put this into practice? Well, one aspect in my mind is not to take offense at the things that are suggested or said, mm -hmm. and to treat everything as basically an idea to be Consider, about, yeah. as opposed to uh, you know something that is uh, very disturbing to you personally. Yeah. Because I think uh, like what this young man said, we, we, each of us brings a lot of baggage, mm -hmm. and sometimes that becomes an impediment. Uh, yeah. The listening. So, so, sometimes you're wrapped up in your position. <laughs> If somebody raises a question that feels like a personal attack, yeah. yeah. I think to be honest, 
the, the biggest problem that we're having right now is uh, from being in this church. I think everything's fine. We <coughs> have a particular problem that's going to come up pretty soon. We're having a, a recruiting crisis, is what I'm seeing. We need more um, people. I'm trying, actually, one of my school, I'm trying to get some people to come in here, but it's, it's really difficult. I don't really know what to say personally. I don't know much about doing that. You know more about that than I do, for sure. You were a missionary. But I think that's the problem that we must have had in sort of recruiting crisis. Yeah. I think don't worry about it too much, but just share what uh, you've found <coughs> with Jesus. You know, that's the biggest thing. Uh, and be patient. Patient. Yeah. I try not to like bother the same person. Right? I try to go like, well, if you're not interested, I'll go to the next guy. Like, I'm not afraid to do that. But it's, it's yeah. Kind of but, you know, as the Lord opens up opportunities, you know, he's, he's going to be going before you and creating opportunities for you to show Jesus' love and to talk about Jesus' love. And, but you don't need to force him. You know, it will be there. Yeah. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know. How, how you guys feel about this. I, I feel like in the past there have been opportunities, or, or, or not opportunities, but occasions when uh, we have not really uh, acted out of love for each other. Uh, whatever the, you know, it, there were good reasons for doing certain things, but the way in which we did them didn't necessarily follow what they were talking about here. Uh, however, I, I'm very encouraged by the fact that, you know, all of us are here and, and, and all of us want to uh, learn and go forward, forgive and be forgiven and, uh, and, and, and move on with what God has for us. Because we're, we, we do say and do things that hurt other people. And sometimes it's within the group, too. And one of the things that we need to learn as Christians is how to reconcile. And I think that um, it, it seems to me that a lot of that is happening with us. And I, I feel very good about that. I think that we're uh, we're starting to put into practice some of these things. Yeah. It doesn't mean we're never going to make a mistake, but it does mean that we have hope because we're with the Lord. Well, that's, that's my take on the question. Yeah, how about the last one there in, the, uh, in that session, section? How do we currently reach agreement on important matters as a congregation, and how well does that approach line up with 2 Corinthians 13, 11? That, uh, 2 Corinthians 13, 11 is uh, further up on the page there. You know, finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration, comfort one another. Hey, was he talking about ascension? Uh, <laughs> agree with one another, live in peace, and the love, God of love and peace will be with you. Uh, the majority votes the way we get to conclusion, usually. What's that? Majority votes. Okay. It's the way we usually come to agreements. And I'm not sure how well that follows. Okay. Except, except for choosing a master. Uh -huh. uh, we, we never, we never go for majority vote. Right. At, at some point or another, you say, well, are we all in agreement with uh, calling this person? Right? Yeah. You, know, you may prefer somebody else, but are you okay with this person? Right. Yeah. But, but there are a, a variety of issues like that. Um, I remember an occasion when there was a problem, when I was on the board of directors of the district, there was a major problem in Denmark. And the pastor and the congregation was, were at odds. And I mean, it was, it was bad. The police were being called and all that. There was no reconciliation. But the real problem was that the congregation could not reach a consensus on how to deal with the problem. Mm -hmm. Although there was a majority of people that agreed to take a certain course of action, it, that course of action 
majority rules was going to splinter the congregation. And I don't believe that on those issues. I mean, yeah, you got to be, you got to do more it, than just it's, the it's, it's not, you know, it is consensus. I mean, truly consensus. Somebody has to give and and live with it. Yeah. Yeah. Not always easy when you're in the church and everything is dear to your heart. Yeah. And then, of course, uh, like Second Corinthians says, I mean, once once you reach a point where you sort of yield, because you know you're going to say, okay, I'd rather have peace than my way, then. Becomes a, a necessary for the other group to comfort, yeah. to assuage, to mm -hmm. reconcile. You yeah, say. yeah. I, I I'm afraid that uh, our our culture here in the United States, the majority culture anyway, is uh, becoming more and more splintered in, in not just in the churches but in uh, in the community in general. Uh, it, it, people are more and more vilifying those who are in disagreement instead of uh, saying, hey, I'm in disagreement, but you're still a part of my community. Um, uh, it, it seems like we're becoming more and more polarized all the time. Could, is, it, is it possible, like, as I was saying before, this is the idea of what I said, is it possible that one side try their idea out first for a time being? And have a vote of confidence saying, okay, this works, we'll go with this, and we'll say this doesn't work, and then give the other minority group their shot. Everybody gets an equal opportunity in their, you get what I'm saying? Yeah, that, that would be uh, possibly a good idea in, in some situations. Because, because then we can yeah. find out for sure that, hey, you know what, if he tries, it, it yeah. didn't work. The only problem is that, like I said before, sometimes you do something twice and it's a tradition that cannot be broken. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, it, it, if, if we can get to the point where we're okay with people who are in disagreement with us, then all kinds of things are possible. Uh, I'm sorry, you wanted to... I think the kinds of things we are doing today, the kinds of meetings we have, there is kind of thing goes a long way to, to creating more of a uh, unified feeling within the whole congregation. Mm -hmm. uh, willing to listen, being uh, feeling safe enough to, to start to speak out and ask questions. I mean, that's the kind of thing uh, mm -hmm. that, that will help to bring this congregation together. And we're starting to do it. I personally am seeing it, and I know other people are. But it's a process. That's encouraging, yeah. Yes, please. The other danger that uh, you have when you start doing strategic planning, especially at a church level, when you have a small body like this, look at the age distribution that we have here. Where is the youth? The youth have just as much input into the strategic planning as we do. And they should be encouraged to attend and seek their input because they're probably the ones that are going to live with what we decide now. And if we decide inappropriately, we'll lose them in the church. So then they're gonna have nothing to complain about. Just always remember the love of Jesus that brings you to peace, that helps you with it. Let's, uh, let's move on a little bit here for the uh, next part. At, at least we'll read it and start the first question, maybe. Uh, uh, I don't think we're going to get through all the questions. Can somebody read the first, maybe, three paragraphs there? Number seven? Huh? Number seven? Yeah. Number seven, yes. Yeah. Defining and agreeing on the congregation's purpose and focus. <coughs> <clears throat> Defining and agreeing on the congregation's purpose, focus, and stewardship priorities sets the stage for discussions 
and decisions on how to carry out the work that the Lord has given to our congregation. While God has made our work clear in general terms, he has not spelled out the specifics. The details are left to us. We need to make the decisions necessary to plan and execute the work required to carry out God's missions in our context. We may not feel that we're qualified to make such important decisions. Martin Luther argues that we are providing what we are relying on God's word and then deciding things. He says, this much is certain. Anyone who knows the Ten Commandments perfectly knows the entire scriptures. In all affairs and circumstances, he can counsel, help, comfort, judge, and make decisions in both spiritual and temporal matters. He is qualified to sit in judgment upon all doctrines, estates, persons, laws, and everything else in the world. Martin Luther, Large Catechism Preface. Luther may have been overstating things a bit to make his point. After all, apart from God himself, who knows God's word perfectly? But because we know God's word, we are able to make God-pleasing decisions, as Proverbs 2, verse 6 through 11 says. Go on. Okay, go ahead and read that uh, the, the citation there. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth some knowledge and understanding. He stirs up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of his saints. When you will understand, then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity. Very good path. For wisdom will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will watch over you. Understanding will guard you. Okay. So, who knows the Ten Commandments perfectly? <laughs> okay, well, I, I was thinking just in terms of having them memorized. You know, when, when, when I went through catechism class, I had to memorize the Ten Commandments. And I promptly forgot them. <laughs> at least memorizing them all, you know. Then I went to uh, Concordia University, and I had uh, classes, in, oh, amongst the other classes, I had some religion classes, and we had to memorize the Ten Commandments again. And then I forgot them. <laughs> and then I went to the seminary, and I had to teach other people the Ten Commandments, and that's when it stuck. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think, like he says, Martin Luther may be um, exaggerating a bit. However, I do think that it is worth our while as Christians to go back over those basics and to think of them once again, and because those are the things that can guide us. Uh, it's true. We are not under law. We are under grace. What that means is that we're not saved because we kept perfectly God's law. We always have failed, and we need Jesus. We need that he died on the cross for us. But that doesn't mean that God's law is useless. God's law is a guide for us. It's what he wants us to be doing. He, if we've been saved by grace, it's so we can serve him. And it, it's hard to serve him if we really don't keep in mind what he has to say to us. Uh, and, and, and so I think he has a good point here in that, it, you know, fo focus on the important stuff, and that will help you to judge the details. And uh, other, another thing here that he's talking about that I think is very important is that remember that God is working through us. And that means that we are his representatives to each other and to the world as well. Uh, he, he didn't send an angel. He sent us. And you're going, why would he send us? with all of our problems, with, with all of the difficulties we've had. But he says, yes, I love you, I know you, and I am going to empower you. He's the one behind everything. Uh, and maybe we can continue and finish off at least the reading here. It, would somebody mind continuing to read the rest, the rest of it there? 
There are several reasons why decisions for the congregation should be made collectively with one voice. Okay, excuse me. Um, at the bottom of page seven, it's important to remember. Oh, okay. Um, a little ahead of you there. It's important to remember that there are some things that are not for us to say. When God's word speaks to us an issue, the decision has been made. But there are many decisions that a congregation needs to make within the boundaries of God's words. Those decisions should be made collectively rather than by a single person. There are several reasons why decisions for the congregation should be made collectively. One, many decisions of the congregation impact the entire congregation. People should have a voice in the things that affect them. No one person has a monopoly on knowing or discerning God's will. We need to seek His will together and discuss what we understand His will to be. The responsibility of decisions should be shared so whatever results from the decision is owned by the whole congregation. God's Word encourages us to seek out each other's understandings when making decisions. Proverbs 11, uh, 14. For there is no guidance, a people falls. But in an abundance of counsel, there is safety. And also a long word is meaning. <laughs> yeah. No, well, the first question there, what are the dangers of having a single person make decisions for the congregation? <laughs> that would be a dictatorship. What's that? That would be a dictatorship. No, no. That would be a dictatorship. Yeah, okay. Do this and this and this. You know, many years ago, there was a phenomenon that they told us in the seminary was the Herr Pastor, <laughs> you know, Mr. Pastor, that uh, basically you, you figured that the pastor was the one that everything funneled through, and um, uh, it was not the case in every congregation, but it was uh, a phenomenon that we saw in different places, and... Uh, or in Europe. What's that? In Europe. In Europe, well, even here in the U.S. Uh, to some extent as well. Um, and sometimes, still today, here you can see uh, power plays, right? Yeah. In Venezuela, we saw some power plays in the congregations. Yeah, there were some times where the uh, pastor would say, I am the pastor, it has to be my way. And the president of the congregation was saying, no, you're just a hired hand. I'm the president. It has to be my way. Yeah. That didn't turn out very well. Well, you're also going to remember that, like, of all the nations of the world, this is the only one with a rebel-like culture. Call it whatever you want. All, I mean, because I've been around, too. Most people are very compliant a tyrant. This is the only nation that has a very rebel-like manner. It's like absolutely not. You make yeah. me feel uncomfortable. I'm gonna make you feel uncomfortable. Now. And people jump in on that. I mean, it's it's good and bad at the same time. Yeah, everything has its good part and its bad part, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, in the seminary, we talked about uh, having uh, being a pastor with a servant's heart. You know, being a servant leader. Yes, you do have some authority, not uh, not autocratic authority, but you do have some authority. But at the same time, Jesus says the one who is going to be first needs to be last. You know, now, there needs to be the servant of all, and there there needs to be uh, a, a thing where it's not my way; it's God's way, and we're here together. Uh, I, I really like the uh, the uh, illustration in my mind of a uh, a football team, you know, and you have different people who have different. Uh, well, we're talking American football anyway. <laughs> you have different people who have different skills. You know, you have the linemen, and you have the quarterback, and you have the receivers, and you have uh, the running back, and you have the uh, defensive people. And you have, yeah, there's all kinds of different. Uh, specialties and they all are working together and there is a captain of the team and not necessarily the quarterback there's a captain of the team but the captain of the team is, is is just there to coordinate and direct and help the team go forward he's not there to say uh, you guys got to do it my way because I'm the captain uh, he may 
he may have to say that when it comes down to the rules of the game. No, you are not going to cheat. <laughs> uh, but uh, it, as far as the details are concerned, they work together. Um, and I see that the same way as with, with us here. Uh, I, see, I see a pastor as kind of the captain of the team. He's not the ultimate autocratic authority. He may have to come down and say, no, we are not going to do this because it's against what God says in his word, you know. Uh, but his job is rather to coordinate all of us in getting God's mission accomplished. And it's not to tell you, okay, we have to do uh, only this play because that's the play I like. Okay. Uh, I don't think we have time for any more, unfortunately. Uh, so, Mark, your thing here, and when Pastor uh, Tom gets back, and you can go on from there. Uh, let's let's close with a prayer and then with the Lord's prayer, if you don't mind. Would, would you mind uh, uh, standing up and we'll pray together? Lord God, thank you for these uh, for this material, for bringing us together, for being here with us. Thank you, and we ask that you would continue to guide us and help us, so that we may do your will in forming the new constitution and uh, searching for a, a new pastor. In everything that we do, Lord, we ask that you, that we would be doing it in accordance with your word and your will, and that you would be the guide for us. <clears throat> we thank you and ask that you go with us now as we worship you and as we go out to the world to share your love. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom of the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. God bless us.